In this last of three estuary lectures, we're going to be looking at time scales, mixing time scales. Um, these are key questions for managers in particular, um, coastal managers, trying to figure out how much time it takes for a uh, pollutant or tracer to diffuse to some kind of level. A great example of that is the, the Mass Estuaries Project, um, in which Brian Howes, uh, our professor, plays a leading role. Um, in their case, they're looking at nitrogen discharge from septic and sewer and road runoff into these estuaries, um, which can lead to eutrophication. And they're trying to figure out, um, estimate how much is going into the estuaries and how and what the residence time of that is. Some of it is involved in processes within the estuary, and some of it is flushed out. Um, this is part of uh, it goes into advising um, towns and municipalities on making major decisions about wastewater treatment um, to contend with the issues, uh, particularly in the Cape and southeastern Massachusetts, related to uh, nitrogen pollution. Um, so one time scale is a residence time, and this is the amount of time a particle is spent in the estuary. You can think about releasing a neutrally buoyant particle and just simply measuring how much time it takes to leave the estuary. Um, so you need a few pieces of information to get at this. Um, the definition of the boundary of the estuary, the location where you release the neutral particle, and the start time to do that. Um, this can be done with a numerical model. Um, here's some example of residence time calculations. Here's one in Portugal um, where they run a circulation model which mimics a circulation in this embayment. Um, and this is uh, this is the opening into the ocean here, and they can estimate the resonance time. Now it's spatially varying, such that in the upper portions of the estuary, you have a longer resonance time. It takes more time for um, um, water parcels up here to make their way to the exit and closer to the to the, the connection with the open ocean. Um, it will be a shorter resonance time on the order of days versus on the order of thousands of days. So very different in that sense. Um, strong spatial dependencies. Here's a similar model for um, another numerical model for Willapa Bay. Um, here you have the Pacific Ocean here, and there's a few rivers up here, Bay River and others, that are supplying fresh water to Willapa Bay in Oregon, um, or Washington rather, and they are here. They ran the model with specific river discharge and open ocean salinity, and they were testing, uh, as I mentioned, the seasonality of the Northwest. Pacific is such that you have strong two two times a year when you have strong river discharge, um, which can modify the the flushing time. But again, strong spatial variation. These are expensive calculations; they're difficult to calibrate. Um, these numerical models. Um, so managers generally need a, a simpler approach than that. Um, so again, as these parcels make their way out of the estuary, they're they're riding the ebb and flow of the tide, um, and so essentially they're oscillating back and forth and making their way in the net downstream. Um, it'd be better to have means of estimating flushing time that don't require a numerical model. Um, that may not be as accurate but are far simpler uh, to get at. And we're going to look at two methods of that in this lecture. Um, there's a few definitions of flushing time. It isn't something that is um, strongly defined. Um, so here we're looking at flushing time, which contrasts with the residence time. Residence time, we can think about a parcel, a particular parcel, how long that will be in residence in the estuary. The average residence time, if we integrate over the entire estuary, um, is the flushing time. So they, they, uh, these two quantities are related. So how do we estimate this flushing time? Um, one definition is the second one, which we're going to focus on, this idea of perfect mixing. At the end of the flushing time, you have 1 over E, where E is 2.71, um, original uh, water remains, and 60%, uh, two-thirds of it is, is new, roughly, roughly two-thirds, or um, 1 minus 1 over E. Um, the first estimate is going to be called uh, what's known as the tidal prism method. So first, in both these estimates, we have to have a sense of how do we quantify quantify flush, flushing time. TF is flushing time. And simply, it's just simply the ratio, it's the time required to replace the volume of fresh water, and I'll define what that is in a second, the volume of fresh water in the estuary divided by the river discharge. So this, the units of the 
numerator is or meter squared, and the new units of the denominator is meter excuse me meter cubed in the numerator and meter cubed per second in the denominator. And so you have meter cubed over meter cubed per second. So this is of unit time. Now we're going to express this VF, this volume of fresh water, as the total volume in the estuary, the total volume of all the water, times what's called the freshwater fraction. This freshwater fraction is a measure of how fresh the water in the estuary is. Essentially, where is that water in the estuary between zero, which is the river, and S0, which is the open ocean salinity. So S0 is some kind of characteristic offshore salinity, and F star is defined as this. You can see that an S star is the is a, is a characterization of the salinity within the estuary. If the salinity within the estuary is all fresh, S star would be zero, and F star would be one, meaning it is fully fresh, or the freshwater fraction is one. If S star the water within the estuary is all equal to the open ocean salinity, then, then this uh, second uh, number here, ratio, is going to be equal to 1, and everything in parentheses here will be 0, and your freshwater fraction will be 0. You essentially have 0 fresh water. Now, TF, the flushing time, depended on these things. V we can compute pretty easily, fairly easily, if you have bathymetry. You can integrate um, that to compute V, the volume of water. Q is river discharge. You need some measure with the river discharge, how much fresh water is coming in. And so really the thing you need to get it is F star, this freshwater fraction. There's two ways to do that. Let me cross this out because we're actually going to go through it here. Both of these ways are also described on the, the reading that I asked you to do this week um, in Matthias Tomzak's online um, section on estuaries, but we're going to also look at it here. Um, first is this idea of what's called the tidal prism method, which comes from a simple model of an estuary known as the perfect mixing model. In the perfect mixing model, we imagine the following to happen. This box is our estuary. During flood, you have amount of water entering the estuary equal to the amount that comes in during that flood tide, VT. The salinity of that water coming in, the VT volume of water, is equal to the open ocean salinity, S0. During that flood tide, you have an amount of fresh water coming in, VR, which is equal to the river discharge times the tidal cycle. So we're considering how much fresh water comes in over an entire tidal cycle. We're going to put it all in during the flood tide. That naturally has a salinity of zero. They mix together perfectly right at the end of that flood tide. And then on ebb, we just, everything ebbs out. So you have river discharge coming in and flood and water from the open ocean coming in and flood with a high salinity. They mix together perfectly. And then it's all exported during ebb. Again, this is a simple model of an estuary. And what's coming out must be equal to the tidal volume that came in and plus the river discharge over a tidal cycle. This is also, those two quantities together are equal to the tidal prism. The salinity that's exported is this unknown quantity that we need to get it in order to get the freshwater fraction, S star. So it mixes together and we have S star coming out. Now let's look at the salt balance um, equation. You have exported at the end of the ebb tide, this quantity, VT plus VR, the, the amount of volume of, that came in during the flood, plus the river discharge over the tidal cycle, times this unknown quantity, S star, must be equal to the amount of salt that was introduced during the flood tide, VTS naught, and no salt is introduced by the river. So this is a salt balance equation um, for the perfect mixing model. Now I'm going to solve this for S star, so I'm going to move this stuff over to the other side, and it results in this expression right here. Um, and now recall, the freshwater refraction is defined as this, so I can substitute this into here and rearrange that, and I end up with this quantity here. The freshwater fraction expressed as a river discharge over a tidal cycle divided by the amount of 
volume coming in from the open ocean over a tidal cycle due to the tidal forcing, plus again that VR again. Now back to my flushing time, T flushing, it's the ratio of the volume of fresh water in the estuary divided by the river discharge rate, meters cubed per second, which we're expressing as the total volume of the estuary times the freshwater fraction divided by the freshwater rate. Now we have the freshwater fraction, which I'm going to put in here. And I'm going to use my resonance time definition. I'm, excuse me. I'm going to use my definition of the river discharge here, which is equal to the amount of volume over a tidal cycle divided by a tidal cycle, which we wrote earlier as VR, the amount of river discharge over a tidal cycle equals the river discharge rate times the tidal cycle. Here I'm just rearranging that expression in order to put Q in terms of VR. And then it results in this a simple expression here that the flushing time is equal to a tidal cycle, okay, about 44,000 seconds, 12.42 hours, times the volume of water in the estuary, divided by VT, which is the volume of water that's introduced um, during the tidal, over the tidal cycle um, by the open ocean tidal forcing, and VR, which is the amount of volume of water, of fresh water that's introduced over a tidal cycle by the river discharge. That denominator is, as I said, the tidal prism. So now we have an estimate of the flushing time given to us by simply the ratio of the time scale of the tide, 12 hours roughly, times the volume of the estuary divided by the tidal prism. We can write it here. So here we see as, for example, if the tidal, if we have a very shallow estuary and the tidal prism is on the same order as the volume of the estuary, then our flushing time is on the order of t because this thing in ratio here is going to be 1. So our flushing time is about a tidal period. If the volume of the estuary is twice the, the tidal prism, then we will find that the flushing time is twice a tidal period. So now you're talking about a day. So again, this tidal prism is a good thing to have in your formula because it's fairly easy to calculate. It's simply the area of the estuary here times the tidal range over a um, tidal cycle. So simply the difference between high water and low water. The second method is known as the Knudsen, Knudsen formula. In this case we assume we have a two layer type estuary where there's even at the mouth of the estuary there's strong gradients. So if we were to drop a CTD down here at the mouth of the estuary we find Fresh water over fresher water overlying saltier water. So we have these two distinct layers, and we're going to require knowing the information of what is the salinity of the upper layer and what is the salinity of the, the bottom layer, S top and S bottom. Now we can express our fresh water fraction in terms of S top and S bottom. So we need to have these measurements. These are actual measurements we need to have. The top upper layer surface salinity at the discharge, the lower layer surface salinity at the discharge. And with that and the river discharge rate and the volume of the estuary, I can compute simply the flushing time. Um, the Matthias book goes into a bit more detail about this, and this is actually a slide from his book. Um, talking about this idea of when do you use these different um, formulas and how do you, what information do you need to get at them. This middle one here, the tidal prism method, you need to know the topography of the estuary, as I mentioned, bathymetry in order to get the volume. You need to know something about the sea level, and sea level plus topography will get you to um, a tidal record plus topography will get you to the tidal, um, the tidal prism. And then you also need to know um, well, you already have your, your tidal, uh, excuse me, your um, tidal time scale, T. That's simply in our region, that's the M2 time scale. And we can get at this number simply from that. Now, what, what is this suitable for? Um, slightly stratified. We can think of partially mixed estuaries, one where the tide is playing a clear role. Think back to the perfect mixing assumption that underlies that formula there. We're assuming that we have perfect mixing of the incoming um, high salinity water and the fresh water from the river over the course of a tidal cycle. 
So that assumes strong mixing. So this is only useful for uh, an estuary where you have strong mixing or a small R over, v, R over V ratio. The Knudsen formula assumes you are dealing with a stratified estuary, one where there's a distinct difference between the upper and lower layer salinity. Um, so we need to use these formulas appropriately and we'll see um, in class that you can end up with some different results. Some flushing estimates here for various embayments. These were done using numerical models um, by NOAA, but you see the, the residence time varies considerably from the order of a few weeks for these sort of estuaries here up to the order of a year for these larger scale estuaries like Corpus Christi Bay. Um, these are all New Mexico uh, area um, harbors.